found these two boys smoking cigarettes on the beach. What should I do with them? And the sergeant at the desk never even looked up. He just said, take them around the back and shoot them both. <laughs> and these two boys <laughs> were so scared that that was the day they both gave up smoking. But of course, the policemen would never do that. They never sort of um, shoot kids or anything, but they just wanted to teach them a lesson and it worked. You know, <laughs> they realized that smoking is a serious business. And so they never smoked again. I remember him telling that story with a lot of laughter on his face when he was telling me that how he gave up smoking. But I don't think you can do that in many countries. But anyway, if there's someone who's a family member who's a pervert and it really is you know, uh, harming many other people, just to tolerate it cannot really be acceptable. But you don't want to hurt the person over much, but you, you can't allow him to hurt other people. So see if you can find some way of just showing the just importance and the, the, the seriousness of what he's doing. And they eventually will get caught. And that means you can actually protect everybody. But you know, I don't know what the perversion is. So it really depends on that and how much harm it's causing. And you know, if uh, one does see the, the danger of those actions, it makes life much easier. They can actually resist what they're doing. <coughs> I don't know if that answers, answers the question, but that's uh, with the information I've given here. You, know, you try and be, you have filial piety and stuff, but filial piety doesn't mean just closing your eyes when you know, maybe a parent is, is misbehaving, because that's not taking sort of a care and responsibility for them, you know, to try and protect them and trying to uh, heal them of their bad habits, if it's possible. <coughs> okay, let's try the next question. Dear Ajahn, for a teenager who suffers from self-criticism and self-harm due to parents' divorce, what would you suggest? Meditation and kindness towards herself seems to be too hard as the emotional pain is too overwhelming. But it's been three years. You know, use some wisdom as well. You know, your parents have divorced, but it's not your fault. I don't know why um, people who are not involved in these decisions sometimes uh, take the blame onto themselves. And quite frankly, in the people which I have talked to, it's more prone that female takes the blame onto themselves much more than men. And you're not responsible at all for that. You could not have stopped it. And when you feel that way, you know that you're not to blame at all. If you were at a court of law or something, they would pronounce you innocent straight away. You know, it's not your fault. And why do people blame themselves? So use some wisdom. And even if you were at fault with anything you do in your life, instead of like blaming ourselves with a constant self-criticism and harm, then what we usually do is we see the mistakes which we have made. And these are real mistakes, which you, know, you could have done better. And we don't punish ourselves because that doesn't help us, doesn't help anybody. Instead, we learn from the mistakes we made. It's one of those things which I was very impressed with Buddhism when I first discovered it as a teenager. We didn't have right punishment in Buddhism, especially for monks and nuns. If somebody did something wrong, they were asked to reflect on what they've done, to acknowledge it. In other words, don't hide it. Uh, let other people, people you trust, know what you did. And then you have this forgiveness which means no punishment, amnesty, and then the learning. You learn from your mistakes. If you punish mistakes, first of all, people hide them and lie about them. If you acknowledge them because you don't fear punishment, and then you learn from them, you become a better person as a result. And that is what the Buddha said is this growth in the Buddhist tradition. So self-criticism, it doesn't help at all. It's a very um, unwise thing to do. And the self-harm because of that doesn't help at all. If you can get a good friend who can actually say that to you, not just once, but many times, I can say that to you, but you're only seeing me on the, uh, the internet screen or hearing me. 
and it's not actually goes deep inside of you. But the best thing is to have a good friend who says, look, you are you are exaggerating what you did. It wasn't a bad thing and not your fault. And so see if you can learn from that. If you're a teenager and um, a teenager and you're learning about life, it shows you that when you, know, you choose a partner in life, make sure you choose wisely and make sure you look after yourself so that you can have a long relationship, hopefully. So self-criticism, sometimes we learn self-criticism you know, from our parents and our teachers always telling you off. And I think I mentioned that this morning that, oh no, it was to somebody else, I think. And that when, when I was at school, I was always doing well at school, always you know, coming top of the class and getting prizes and stuff, but always I say, you can always do better. But after a while, I thought, what are you talking about? I'm doing pretty good. What do you mean always do better? And what it was was your friends and relations. They were just trying to make you, you do as best as you possibly could. But that criticism was not helpful. So it's much better, instead of like criticizing people, you're not doing well enough, you can do better. I should say, that's wonderful what you've done. Congratulations. You're out of the bottom class this year. Well done. I'm so proud of you. Because if you praise people's efforts rather than criticizing their failings, you always just do much better growth and more improvement that way by praising what you have done and have achieved. And that's with the teenage girl. So praise all her wonderful qualities. And after a while she finds, well, I actually have got some wonderful qualities. And then when you see the wonderful qualities, as I said, put them on that piece of paper, lying down the, the middle, on the left-hand side, all the terrible things that she has done. Say it with kindness. Okay, all the things which are really bad about you and wrong about you, write them down on the left-hand side of the piece of paper. Right-hand side of the piece of paper, all the wonderful things you've done. You have to help her. Now, once she's written down all the wonderful things she's done, self-praise, then cut that piece of paper along the line in the middle. Left-hand side of the piece of paper, just uh, throw it in a waste bin, or even better, just uh, put it in the, uh, what's it called, the shredder. And then afterwards, just photocopy the right-hand side, all the wonderful things that young lady has done in her life, and photocopy it, laminate it, and leave it around, around the house. So she can always be reminded of her good qualities. And then she finds she's more than worthwhile. I want to know when will I meet a new guy again and remarry? And it, if it is going to be a good decision, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I'm not a marriage counselor or uh, a, what they call a matchmaker, but I do know there's so many good guys out there and so many good girls out there. You know, they, they come and talk to me and they sort of, uh, you get to know them and just what a, sensitive and what a willing person they are but i don't know why you know when people meet each other they hide their good qualities they don't relax and show people what they're really like and most people you know human beings a human realm is a quite a high birth so most human beings given the chance can be very wonderful and sensitive there's lots of guys out there are looking for a partner lots of partners lots of uh, girls are looking for a guy and uh, it's also the case, I do remember going to give a talk in Singapore some years ago at Taiping Center. It was on Valentine's Day. And of course, you know, the, I don't know who was organizing it, Buddhist Fellowship or Brahms Center or Bodhinyan, I forget who, They're actually mostly the same people. But anyway, that uh, Angie was the MC and she said, it's Valentine's Day and said, Look, you know, there's so many people, you know, in our community who are looking for a partner, haven't got one. There's so many good people here. So she asked, please put your hand up, all the men and women here uh, who haven't got a partner. And of course, I was the first one to put my hand up. <laughs> and, I, and you say, we're not talking about you, Ajahn, but put your hand down now. <laughs> 
was only doing that for a joke. I don't want a partner. I'm having a wonderful time being a monk. But when you meet a new guy again and remarry, it's when you look for a new guy and you don't look for the perfect guy. You look for the kind guy. So look for their kindness. And the other qualities such as, you know, their, their honesty. So, you know, if there's someone who's taken five precepts and they're keeping those five precepts, they don't get drunk, they're not going to commit adultery and have another, uh, another woman in their life, just you. And uh, you can trust them, they're honest with you. And those guys are just gold. So if you find someone in like a Buddhist group who keeps the precepts, they're usually a very good bet for a wonderful marriage. So give it a try. Hi Ajahn, recently I had this experience while meditating. Everything before me froze and stopped moving. Very calm feeling, sounds good. And I started to think, what should I do next? And I see colored dots, crowds moving again. Can you advise, please? This is like a bad habit of us. We're in the present moment, things are happening, things are going really, really well. And then we think, what should I do next? You're having a wonderful time right now. And please understand that the deep meditations, the joys, the insights, the enlightenment, all of those things don't happen next. They happen now. So we sort of train ourselves in meditation to actually not even think about next, not the next moment, not the next hour, not the next day. Because right now is all we have. And we really get used to staying in the now and trusting in this now. And the next will look after itself. So we disturbed the, the meditation by going to the next instead of being right here now. In that simile which I gave the second morning of the thousand petal lotus, you know, you've opened the lotus with your mindfulness and kindness and your lotus is so open, it's nice and still there. But then you go off to the next lotus, you know, which is positioned next to the one you've opened now. And so the one you've opened now starts to close again. So just stay where you are and just be patient, be kind, be gentle, and just let the lotus open by being with one lotus the present moment and letting it open for you. Dear not Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> I have a wish to donate my organs when I died. I'm sure it'd be more beneficial to people rather than cremating it. What's your take on this? And there is, is there such a thing in the suttas? Is it approved in Buddhism? Yeah, it's approved in Buddhism. I was just looking around with my Organ donor card is available for me to show to you, but you know it's not actually right in front of me. I am an organ donor. I'm very happy to donate my organs when I die. And I'm really happy if you could actually donate my brain when I die. If I donated my brain when I die, I'd like to see if the person who gets my brain tells bad jokes like I do, to see how much is carried over. Usually nothing is carried over, but I'm very happy to donate anything which I have for anybody who needs it. And you get much better, good karmic results in your next life. I know that some people think, oh, if you donate your organs, say you donate your eyes, you're gonna be blind in your next life. No way. Because of your giving and charity, you're going to have incredible sight in your next life. Next life. Because you know, giving is good karma. And if you've seen people like, uh, people who are on dialysis because there's not enough kidneys uh, to have transplants. I remember years ago going to a couple of dialysis clinics, I think it was in Malaysia, and feeling so sad that people had to spend you know, many hours twice a week having dialysis to survive because there wasn't enough kidneys. Not the kidneys, uh, yeah, it was kidneys, yeah. Kidneys to transplant uh, into the people who needed them. But then I heard that in, uh, uh, in Spain, in Spain, there aren't any dialysis clinics. I think maybe a few emergency ones in hospitals because there's so many uh, people donating their organs in Spain. They don't need to have dialysis clinics. The people can get an organ transplant so the, the blood can be purified by, by an organ which is donated. So that's an obvious compassionate thing to do. So usually you can get some sort of card or 
some sort of permission which you can carry around with you. So if you have like an accident somewhere or you die very suddenly, that the doctors who are responding to you can actually see, yes, this person has given permission for their organs to be harvested and to be used for other people so they can have a wonderful life. What a great good karma that is, to be able to give a good life free from having to have all these interventions once, twice, three times a week to a person by giving your organs so other people can be happy. That's really, really immense good karma. So I do it, so don't see why anyone else can't. Do Ajahn, what is a good thought to meditate on self-forgiveness? A nice good thought is you don't have to be perfect in this world, and no one is perfect. Even like someone like an Ajahn Chah, I saw him make a couple of mistakes on this one occasion when I was still with him uh, years and years ago. It was the, the wife of the US ambassador in, in Bangkok. She was very interested in Buddhism. And so she made an appointment to come up and see Ajahn Chah. And Ajahn Chah, instead of just you know, letting her fade into the background because she had enough uh, status and publicity as you know, the wife of the American ambassador uh, in Bangkok, she just wanted to disappear and live a nice simple week meditating and listening to some teachings. But Ajahn Chah arranged this big ceremony for her to welcome her and was giving her all sorts of nice things and, and special attention where she wanted just to be simple. And so Ajahn Chah got it wrong there and she never came back again. And I always, Ajahn Chah did some amazing things, but sometimes he made mistakes. So when you make a mistake, you forgive. First of all, you have to acknowledge, yeah, it was a mistake. No one is perfect in this world. You mistake and acknowledge it. Tell people what you did. And then when you tell people what you did, then you can forgive it and you can learn. So that's what we do. You thought of imperfection, truthfulness, and it's wonderful kindness. And of course, you know all about my mistakes. One of those mistakes I did <laughs> was... And they're doing chanting. Sometimes I get tired, my energy is down. And I remember doing this chanting and a marriage ceremony. And I did the wrong chanting. I did the funeral chants instead of the marriage chants for these two people getting married. I felt very guilty afterwards. I never told them because actually they're still happily married. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's the truth. So I made mistakes, but I love telling people about them. And after that, I told it. So many people know that. If they come for a blessing for their marriage, they always remind me, you're not tired, are you? Please do the right chant. We don't want the funeral chant, please. Not in a marriage. <coughs> Can you please give us a simple take-home message or simile regards to Anicca at Anatta? <coughs> well, if I give you a simple message, it's not going to last. Especially not an Anicca. An Anatta, you probably lose it on the way home because it doesn't belong to you. So anicca anatta, a simple take-home message or simile. Ah, oh, okay. This, <laughs> I don't know if I can get away with this, but I'm feeling in a bit of a silly mood. I've just been talking with the monks about you know, what I'm going to do on the New Year's Eve uh, at John Brown's party in a few days' time. We make it very much, a lot of fun. But anyway, this is a, a Buddhist joke. You know that sometimes, you know, people make jokes and you remember jokes. And this is a Buddhist joke of anicca, dukkha and anatta. That's impermanence, suffering and non-self. They walk into a bar. <laughs> and uh, a dukkha says, said, oh, this bar is terrible. And anicca, don't worry, it will change after a while. And anatta said, who said that? Who said that? That's a Buddhist joke about three people walking into a bar. I don't know if you find it funny, but over in Australia, people crack up on that one. <laughs> okay, someone is saying it. I like that. Nothing wrong with my funeral chant because people are saying goodbye to their freedom or something. I don't know. Anyway, so Anicca Dukkha Anatta. The nicest thing about Anatta, which people find it very easy to practice, is just realize that things don't belong to you. 
that you're a visitor, you're not an owner. And if you have a sickness, you're a visitor, or the sickness is a visitor to your body, it's not who you are. So you don't need to feel that um, you have been uh, let down. Sickness comes and it goes, it's anicca. As Ajahn Chah said to me when I was really, really sick with typhus fever, he said, Bama Wang, so you'll either get better or you'll die. That was uh, anicca, it won't, it won't last. And actually that was funny, but it's actually quite reassuring. And anatta, it's not me who's sick, it's just the body who's sick. And it's not me who's smart, it's the body who's smart. And if you make a mistake, it's not you who's made a mistake. It's just that your, your brain has made a mistake. So why worry about it so much? You're a visitor, not an owner. Anyway, it is very painful to see our loved ones struggle with illnesses, wondering if they're ever going to get better or well and be free from their intense suffering. I struggle a lot with it too. How can I help them and help them get better? <coughs> you know, sometimes that, you know, if you have your loved ones and they have illnesses, when you go to visit them, don't talk about their illness. Let their doctors talk about their illness. They know much more better about illness. You talk to them as a loved one, a friend. You now go beyond their illness. Illness is only part of them. But sometimes they focus on it over much. It's like that's all there is there, just their illness. So this came about from a story when I was um, counseling. Uh, she was an Australian, but she was a Tibetan nun. And I was counseling her when she had very bad cancer and she was dying of cancer. And she went into the hospice, the very early hospice, not the one where Ted uh, cured himself by eating his favorite food. This was another place earlier on. And she called me up one day at monastery here in Perth saying that she thinks she's going to die within 24 hours. And I'm not sure if you've seen this, but sometimes when people say that, it's true. You know, they know they're getting close to the end. And so I said, can you please come and see me? So I stopped everything I was doing and just got a lift to the hospice. I'm now, now I'm a quarter away and just uh, checked in at the desk there where the, the matron was on duty. And I said, I've come to see this, um, this Buddhist nun. And she said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. I said, well, look, she just called me up and I just rushed her to see her. And then she said, we have to respect our patient's wishes. She's given explicit instructions. She does not want to have visitors. But I've come such a long way, I complained. And the matron was very upset at me, but I wasn't going to back down because she just called an hour and a quarter before. There must be something going wrong here. So she dragged me to the patient's door of her room. And sure enough, there's a big sign on the patient's door. Absolutely no visitors. Big, she'd written a piece of paper herself, this poor nun. And the nurse looked at me and said, see? And then I looked at that piece of paper and just right at the very bottom, in small uh, print, was the words, three letters, three words, except Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and I, I've, I've admitted this mistake many times. I should have been more compassionate, but I just couldn't resist it. I looked at that matron, that nurse, and said, see? <laughs> and she went off in a huff and let me go into the door. But the reason I tell that story is because the first thing I did when I met that man was to ask her, why did you put that sign on the door? And why did you let me come in? Just me. And what that man told me, I will always remember, and I, I use this as a teaching tool for anybody visiting sick people, especially your sick relations and loved ones. She said, you're the only person who comes in here and speaks to me. Other people come and speak to my sickness. Other people come and they get emotionally disturbed when they see just how close to death I am and how I lost all my muscles and my hair and just I look just almost like a zombie but you actually speak to me. So thank you. That's what I want you here for. Not for, to lay your emotional turmoil onto me, but you to treat me 
as a friend. I'm never going to die. I just want to you know, listen to the latest jokes or, or just to talk about some Dhamma. And then that's what I did for about an hour. Tell some jokes, talk about the Dhamma. Be a good friend. I talked to her, not to her sickness. And that's a little quick teaching to take home with you. If you go and visit someone in hospital, talk to them as a friend. Don't talk to their sickness. They get too much of talking to their sickness. They know they're sick. You just talk to them as a good friend. Have a good chat with them. Because that's what you'd like to do when you meet people, just to talk about any old thing. And then just so you can enjoy each other's company. And that means that they get relieved of just looking at the, the pain or the difficulty of their sickness. So see something more just in the illness. Okay, next question. I discovered your videos in 2014 at home in Canada. My life was transformed, I hope for the better. I experienced nimitus, war, but I moved to Beijing for med school where I failed for the entire five years and I had applying what I learned from you. I hated my time there, why? Well, I don't know why you fail. To me, there is no failure in life. You may not have achieved what you'd set out to achieve, but sometimes those goals may have been just too uh, unreachable for you. But you learn so much. You learn so much, you know, just about uh, med school, studying, and what you're doing there. Remember one of the most famous teachings I taught to doctors was that the job of a doctor, the job of anyone in med school was not to cure people, but to care for people. And it's a totally different way of looking at your profession. So you care for the people who are in you know, your ward or who are given to you as, as you know, you're their doctor, you care for them. And you never need to fail if you care for people. Curing people, sometimes you have sicknesses, diseases, which cannot be cured. But you can always care for people every time. And that makes you a success, not a failure. So I don't know what else you did, but it was a wonderful experience. You went to med school. You went to Beijing. I'm sure you had a wonderful time there. If you look at the beautiful things you've learned, it may not have been exactly what you expected. But welcome to life. Life is always a series of unexpected, unplanned moments. Honestly, I never thought when I was 69 that I'd be a, a Buddhist monk. Certainly not a Buddhist monk teaching on Zoom. <laughs> That's totally beyond all my expectations. So, but I'm, I'm happy with it. Dear Bante Brahm, how to explain rebirth to my critical family, especially my teenagers? Thank you. It's sometimes, I'm not quite sure who your teenagers are, but you say, look, it's evidence-based rebirth. And do a little bit of research online, and there's just so many stories of rebirth. And um, if they're Christians, tell them that if they don't know this, that early Christianity believed in reincarnation, rebirth. And it was 543 AD that the Pope, whose name was Vigilius, uh, he was asked by the emperor at the time, it was one of the Justinians. This was in Constantinople, present day Istanbul. But then it was called Constantinople. And it was asked by the um, the Roman emperor there, Emperor Justinian, to please ban belief in reincarnation. And the Pope refused. He said, no, I'm not gonna ban this because he believe, believed in it. And so what the emperor did, he put the Pope in jail in Constantinople for one year. So the power was with the Roman emperor or you know, the Byzantium emperor not with the church. And so he put the Pope in jail for one year. And jails in those days were way, way more um, cruel and harsh than modern day prisons anywhere in the world. And so after one year, the Pope gave in and said, okay, I will ban the belief in rebirth, make it an 
anathema, which means something you can't believe in. And then the emperor released the Pope from jail. And that happened 543, 544 AD in history. So you can check that up if you wish. And it just shows you that teenagers can sometimes like that idea, but see the history of it, see the big truth in it. But also there's many people who can remember their past lives. And these are people you can trust and they write about it. And so ask your teenagers, please be more critical. Please check out the evidence. Please ask the questions and you'll find there's huge amounts of evidence that this is not your first birth. And even as you may have heard me saying that uh, just recently, Roger Penrose has got behind the people who recognize that there's evidence of our previous universe before the Big Bang. Just now you can uh, test that evidence out in the cosmic radiation throughout this, this uh, universe. And the evidence is there. This is not the first Big Bang. Even universes get reincarnated as it were. So does everything else. This universe, this life is always circular. It's never a straight line. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. It goes round and round and round. Just like planet Earth, just like the Milky Way, just like all of life, round and round and round. Anyway, dear Ajahn, can a person use new technologies that changes the brain functioning and behavior to make oneself happy, i.e. neurotherapy or music instead of remembering the Dharma or good things in our life before we die to rebirth in the heavenly realm. Now you can use some of those things, but nothing is as powerful as the Dharma because that gets to the heart of things. And yeah, you can sort of put implants in or, or take chemicals to make you happy, but those chemicals wear off. And same as the neurotherapy can wear off because that just affects the brain. And the Dharma affects the mind. And these are two different things. The brain will pass away at your death. The mind, what the Buddha called the stream of consciousness, will continue on. So what you do to your brain eventually just wears off when the brain passes. What you do to your mind stays much, much longer. And it's the mind you take off into your next life, not your brain. And so that's one of the reasons why to train your mind with Dharma, good things, meditation, generosity, to do and loving kindness. That is making your mind strong. Neurotherapy, drugs and stuff, that's actually making the brain a bit smarter. Two different things. Dear Ajahn, no chance to visit your monastery during COVID period. Is it? I don't know. Is it possible to let us have a glimpse of your cave through a virtual tour? <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. I think there is some virtual or some photos, virtual tour of my cave. There's nothing much there. It's pretty boring. It's just three meters. Uh, like imagine like a hemisphere, three meters diameter, but made of rock. You know, just uh, inverted. So the base is this circle about three meters diameter and it's about sort of two and a half, three meters high. And that's it, made of rock. So it's very, very simple. But it's it's easy to look after, it's cool. I think if you look somewhere you can find some some uh, pictures of the cave. It's not much of a virtual tour because there's nothing much to see. But the main thing about that cave is just sitting in it, it has energy, power. And that's something you can't sort of convey over the internet. It looks peaceful, it looks nice, but actually to sit there and feel the energy, whoa, that's something else. And to emphasize that point, many years ago, it's actually while my cave was being made, that um, I did my six month silent retreat. I never saw a human being for six months, never spoke to anyone for six months. And during that whole time, I had some wonderful meditations in my, it's a hut here in Bodhinyana Monastery. 
And because I never saw anyone or communicated with anyone for six months, all the other monks, they didn't know whether I was going to be crazy or enlightened or somewhere in between. And so they were really interested in waiting for me to come out. But also they knew that when I came out, I'd have to move from that hut to another hut. And so they were, there was a lot of competition, I was told, on who was going to sit and take over that hut where I went on retreat after I left. And one of the monks, they sort of were agreed upon, they were going to move uh, into that hut when I, once I left it. I remember him telling me that once I left the cave myself, he went down there to move in. He said he couldn't get through the door. He says, there's just too much energy in the cave. No, this is not the cave, sorry. In that hut, the room was just so powerful. He said he just, he couldn't do it, couldn't go in there. And so he went back to his old hut, stayed there for two or three days and allowed the energy of all that great meditation I did in there to sometime, somehow dissipate. And once it dissipated, then he could go and move in. But what you do in a place, it does leave an imprint. In this particular case, in six months of beautiful meditation, that left a really strong imprint in that, ca in that hut. So much that even a monk couldn't sit in there, which is too powerful for him. Remember him telling me that story. Anyway, dear Ajahn, how can one develop clarity in making better decisions? E.g. when there are no clear cut solutions, whether at work or life, and how do we overcome the fear of what I make the wrong decision? Thank you. <laughs> so how do you make better decisions? Okay. There was a similar question when I was giving a talk at Oslo University by this uh, young woman. And I said, well, let's make it a little bit more clear what the decision is. Just for example, suppose you're trying to think of the important decision, whether you should marry the boy sitting next to you. Oh my goodness, she held her face in her hands and went red, because I got it right. That's what she was trying to make a decision on. And that's an important decision in your life. So you have to make a better decision or any decision. What should she do? So I told her, I said, um, put your hand in your pocket, get out a coin and toss a coin. Heads I marry him, tails I don't. And of course, people burst out laughing. They thought I was being just not respecting the importance of the question. But then I said, no, take out a coin, heads I marry him, tails I don't. Toss that coin. So say it comes out heads, heads I marry him. How do you feel? What's your reaction? If your reaction is, yes, yes, yes. If your reaction is, mm, maybe I'll try two out of three. It's your reaction, which was telling you what you really want to do. And it's usually following your insight, following your heart rather than the logic in your head. It's been found through so many studies to give much better solutions and much better decisions. So follow how you feel rather than what you think when you make decisions. And if you do make a mistake, you fear, of, what if I make the wrong decision? It's not really a wrong decision. It's just a different decision because you don't know what would have happened if you went the other, other way, made the other decision. No one ever knows what is the right decision or wrong decision. It's just a different decision. And so what you do, if things don't work out as you expect it, then we learn from it. We grow from it, we become better people. So in life, don't try and be perfect. When things go wrong, so-called wrong, great, more opportunity for me to learn and grow. When you step in the dog poo, more fertilizer for your mango tree. So that means you're also not afraid of making decisions. As you find there is no such thing as a right decision or a wrong decision. The decision which gives you some Results you never expected, and sometimes it can be painful results, but you learn so much from that. And sometimes they give you much better results than you'd ever expected. It's like when I decided to become a monk, I never realized you know, the enormous benefits of that decision. It's incredible. I never perceived that would happen. But was it a wrong decision when it led to things I never expected? No way. I always find that you make decisions easily and you learn from them. They all work. 
Ajahn Brahm, what is this strange feeling at the middle of my forehead between my eyes when I meditate? It's probably a mosquito. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm being facetious. Is there such a thing as a third eye? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Apparently there might be a third eye there, but two eyes is enough to worry about. What do you want a third eye for? So it's much better to look at the feeling in the middle of the forehead between your eyes and just let it go and don't give it any importance. So your whole body can vanish instead of actually trying to develop anything different or special. That's my advice. Ajahn, what does it mean to be a filial son or daughter to his or her parents in Buddhist teachings? Thank you so much for your guidance. It is to care for your parents and have gratitude for them. Now, how you care for your parents and have gratitude for them, it just really depends. Sometimes the idea for respect or the word for respect is like in Pali, is Garu Karoti. And what it means literally is like giving them extra heaviness. In other words, when you weigh up all the advice you are given when you make your decisions in life, what your parents say has more weight than other people. But it doesn't mean that other people's opinions and advice do not sometimes outweigh your parents' advice. So you listen to your parents and what they say, you really take seriously and very weightily. We have, may have a whole lot of other people as well. Also you listen to, and sometimes they say to do something differently. And their advice can sometimes outweigh your parents' advice. And a good example of that is the Buddha and his parents. Now he had a father and he ran away from his father to become a Buddha. So was that filial? It certainly worked out wonderfully well for the Buddha himself and his parents and his son. So it worked out very, very well. It was a wonderful decision to run away because you know, he was wise and he needed to do that. So sometimes you don't always follow your parents' advice because that's not the Buddha's teachings. That's not what the Buddha did. But you have to just respect your, your parents' advice and you know, look after them for the rest of your life. Always look after your parents. And if they're dead, always remember them and do meritorious actions for them. You may think that I'm an Angmo or a Kwailo, a Westerner, and it's not part of my tradition. But when other people are making merit for their parents, I also make merit for my parents. And I remember one occasion that oh, my mother had died about three or four years previously. And I was in Bangkok and I don't know the person who gave me the, the, the dana that day, the lunch that day. They gave me a dish, a Western dish. And it was my mother's favorite food. And when they gave me that food, which my mother loved, it was, if you want to know, it was like, uh, what was it? For those of you who know English food, bangers and mash, sausages and mashed potato and gravy. So simple, but my mother loved that. So what I did was to um, uh, remember, I took extra of that out of kindness to my mum. I did a little blessing for her afterwards. This is me sharing the merits of what I was doing, teaching really a lot of things and giving retreats in Bangkok, sharing all of that to my mother. So I do that a lot and I really get off and then I teach it to other people you know, to share the merits with your, your deceased family. Oh, dear teacher, I was hurt and had always forgiven my sister's numerous crazy acts for the past 50 years. Oh, well done. I'm really tired and want to treat my, myself fairly by cutting ties with her, except matters regarding our mom. Please advise, is there a better way? Now, sometimes you have to do that. We call it loving the tiger, but at a distance. So you 
you cut ties with her, but not completely. Just be more distant from her so she can't hurt you so much. But you can still just, you know, keep in touch every now and again. You know, and just say, I exist and I care for you, but at a distance, I can't be so close to you anymore because I've been hurt too often. And that is fine, that is fair enough. I don't know what your sister's numerous crazy acts are, but for the past 50 years, whew, that's a long time. But anyway, I'm sure that maybe later on that she can just understand that she's hurt you. Maybe she hasn't understood that yet. And maybe towards the end of her life, she can be a much kinder sister. I often get depressed by my husband's, by my husband, he's selfish. Self-indulged and hardly enjoys the company of kids and family. That makes me feel sorry for the kids. Is it that wishing he would change is my desire? How am I to live with the least damage? Thanks. Don't know how old your children are, but if your husband's selfish, self-indulged, he doesn't enjoy the company of the kids and family, maybe that gives you more opportunity to compensate for the kids and family by spending more time with them, maybe less time with him. You know, but you can look after your kids and your family, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do. And as for your husband, as long as you know, he doesn't hurt you in any other ways, so that he earns enough money, pays the bills, say thank you for that. So see his kindness, there's some kindness there, He's not totally selfish, he just he could be a bit more kind. So see the part of him which is already kind, the whole thing which he already does for everybody, and just thank him for that. Because I don't know how old, how many years you've been married, but you probably won't be able to change him. But at least you can love your kids to bits. And they have like a mum who really cares for them and loves them, and that's wonderful. Don't need to feel sorry for the kids. You just give them extra. Kids will understand. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I feel delighted when practicing metta meditation, yet I develop a sense of calmness when practicing Anapanasati. Can I combine these two methods during meditation? Yes, you can. And <laughs> this, you, know, you really sort of hit a spot in me when you asked that question. Because years and years ago, I asked the same question of myself. I really love metta meditation. I love Anapanasati. Why can't you do both at the same time? And I did. Wow. That was so powerful for me. I didn't get much sleep that night. I must admit, I was teaching meditation retreat. And so I said, let's try Anapanasati with loving kindness. Look at your breath. May my breath be so happy and well. And I zapped my breath with so much kindness and so much joy and so much metta. I love you, breath. And may you just go in as rough or smooth as you like, as long or short as you want to, not how I want you to. I really appreciate you. You've been sending air into my body since I was born and taking all the used products out. I haven't really respected you or showed my appreciation. I just give you so much love and kindness. You're like a best friend, a servant who's worked night and day, even when I'm asleep, to look after me. It was beautiful loving kindness towards my breath and phew, it was so easy to watch my breath and the breath became so bright and limitless in the whole works. Because I remember that, that night because I tried to get some sleep but I was just so energized. And I remember just, I must have uh, gone an hour or two of sleep because I remember waking up. The reason I woke up because in my, my sleep, I sort of dreamt, we call it dreaming, visualizing this really lovely nimitta, very bright and beautiful. And that was the end of my sleep. You know, just the mind was too energized to sleep anymore. I remember that was just so much fun. So yes, please do. Loving kindness and Anapana Sati, put them both together. It's really powerful. A wonderful time. Uh, Jim Brown, am I right that your morning session sharing of the practical aspects of the establishment of mindfulness, you shared about emotion this morning. Am I right this is related to the contemplation of feeling? Yes, not so much contemplation of feeling, because contemplation, I think, is just too cerebral. I like ex exploration of feeling, exploration of the body, exploration of the mind. 
rather than thinking about it and taking notes about it and trying to get some um, intellectual connections towards these things. Feel it. Not with like sense of um, the sensations, but this beautiful emotions where you get to know things just by the ability to inspire you and feel them. I mean, as I mentioned this morning, you have something like peace. You have something like meta. What is meta? You can spell it. You can spread it to other people. But what actually is it as an emotion? And as you start developing meta, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It's so powerful. You can really hang out in, in meta for such a long, easy time. Because it's an emotion. You're with it, and it's very attractive. And then those beautiful emotions, they become so powerful and you know the emotional world of your mind much more than the descriptions of the mind, which is the intellect. So, the practical aspects of establishing the mindfulness, of course they are. So when we do even the, the bodily relaxation, that's the, the first Satipatthana, becoming aware of our physical body. And also, one of the most important things, not the rise and fall, that is a very, very bad interpretation or translation of the Satipatthana Sutra. It doesn't mean rise and fall. It means the causes, why things arise, and the causes, why things disappear. So you understand just how the body arises and how it can disappear, how it can become really peaceful. And then you go to the chitta, you know, just how to have some peace in the mind. The peace ometer is a chitanapasana. You know, doing the, the third establishment of mindfulness, getting to know this chitta and how it relaxes. And when you go off to the, the breath, then you're actually going on to the second satipatthana, the feelings, the joy, the pity sukha, the, the delightful breath. So each one of these, you know, that sometimes these four satipatthanas, they just they get mixed up. A bit of this, a bit of that, and that is fine. But it's mostly just one rather than the other. Okay, next question. Are there thoughts in the mind when one experiences nimitta? My mental vision turned bright despite my eyes being closed in a dark room, but thoughts remain. If there are thoughts remaining, they're not very disturbing thoughts and they're very peaceful thoughts. And they're not thoughts about what you're going to have for dinner this evening. There are thoughts about this nimitta. In other words, they're almost like focused around the object of your meditation. But they're not very strong. So like small thoughts, like beautiful nimitta, or just gold, or like bright, simple things. If it's complicated thoughts, you will find that will not allow the nimitta to really develop and get very strong. So instead of having too many thoughts, have less thoughts, and just have more uh, focus on the nimitta. The mental vision turned bright. I'm not sure if you saw an object like a, like a moon or like a sun glowing in your mind. But as the thoughts get less, that nimitta gets more simple and gets brighter and more brilliant. And it gets incredibly bright and brilliant. For those of you who have these experiences, and some students do, and I certainly had it, sometimes the nimitta was appearing like a beautiful sun in my mind. Just like, you know, with your eyes open, looking up in the sky, the clear blue sky, and seeing the sun in the middle of the day, it was brilliant. But I thought, I'm going to go blind if I keep watching this. There was a thought came up, but a negative thought, but the positive thought was, this is not seen with my eyes. This is seen with my mind, with my mental eye, if you like. And so you never go blind. So you can watch that nimitta, your eyes being closed in a dark room, it can be brighter than the sun. You don't need to be afraid or concerned at all. It can be as bright as it wants, and you're perfectly healthy. I have extreme body numbness when I woke up today. Like I have problems moving my arms and legs when walking back feels weak and problems speaking if I need to. This is unusual. This is due to outcome of excess meditation or should I go and see a doctor? 
I hope it just disappeared after a few minutes. If it's like disappeared after a few minutes, then it's just, you know, when you woke up, you only half woke up. And then the rest of the body had to take a bit of time to wake up. It's not really uh, common, but I'm not quite sure if you have any other uh, medical conditions. If this was a strange experience, like problems moving my arms and legs when walking back feels weak and problems speaking if I need to. If that didn't last for very long, it's fine. It can be just a problem with sleeping and just not knowing how to wake up properly. And it disappears by itself after a while. I, it's never the due to outcome of excess meditation. Meditation can make you quiet and peaceful. And maybe you can't sort of, you don't want to move or you walk very slowly or speak very softly. But that usually disappears by itself after a while. It never feels like it's a problem. It just feels like you just want to be calm. You don't want to move so much. You don't want to speak. So I'll just see how that develops over the next few days. And if it's, it feels like it's just, your mind just wants to be calm. It's not a physical problem. Then just no need to see a doctor. Dear Ajahn, during meditation, can we imagine ourselves to be in a very quiet, serene park? I find that I can be really still that way. Yes, please do that. Sometimes I do that. But I choose the park which I imagine. And the park which I imagine to be in <laughs> is the, uh, uh, what's it called, Bodh Gaya. If you've been there before, I went there when I was 23. I don't know, 74 or something, 73. And in those days, there was hardly anybody there. It was amazing. This was during the rainy season retreat, maybe in sort of August or September or something. It was so quiet. So you could walk around and sit around, and it was beautiful, very peaceful. Now, nowhere like how many people go to Bold Gaia today. But it gave me an insight into what it must have been like in the time of the Buddha. Beautiful, calm, peaceful park next to the river, good air out of the shade of a tree. And I sometimes imagine that when I start meditating. And, oh, and just adding that extra quality. This was where the Buddha became enlightened. That really gets me going, gets inspired and get very peaceful. So yes, please do that. Third attempt, hopefully lucky on asking the question. Yes, you're lucky you asked the question. And you're doubly lucky because I'll give an answer. Where's the middle path between giving all you've got and this is good enough? How can a householder find the middle path amid spouse, children and business? <laughs> you have the middle of your day. You have the middle of the afternoon. You take moments where you can rest. Good example of that, this lawyer who I once knew a long time ago now, over in New York. He was a lawyer, he was uh, doing criminal cases where sometimes the penalty was execution. So it's a very stressful job for him and as a criminal lawyer. And so one day he decided to, again with his secretary, a female secretary in those days, with his secretary, he took out all his papers from a cupboard in his office. He put them somewhere else to, to free up the cupboard. And he put a cushion in there and he got his secretary to lock him in there for half an hour every lunch hour. So he could relax and meditate. It was his like, relaxation time. And when anybody called, you know, the old phones in those days, uh, she would answer the phone and say, I'm sorry, He's in his cupboard. <laughs> she enjoyed saying that. And he did that because he needed to relax his mind and he found himself a far better lawyer in the afternoon, having taken that half hour break, a real break with meditation. He gave that rest everything he had. His secretary was more than happy to lock him in there because he was a much better boss uh, in the afternoon. So you do give it whatever's in front of you now, whatever you need to do, whatever is the job you need to do, you give that everything you've got. If you're with your children, you're with your children, you're not at business. 
if you're in your business, you know, you're not in the off, you're not with your in your home. If you're in your cupboard or in the retreat meditating, that's what you're doing. You give that everything you've got. And you find that that is more than good enough. You find you have this wonderful sense of um, contentment. Your children, sometimes we always want our children to do better at school, but they're good enough. And you're kind to them and you really welcome them. They surprise you sometimes. That sometimes you feel they're hopeless and not wasting their time. And then, they, then they end up going to Oxford or something. And your spouse, oh, isn't it? she's a nice enough lady. And then she's given birth to your children. She may not be the most amazing woman in the world, but she's pretty fine, more than good enough. And business, it's, a, it's surviving. And so you have this wonderful sense of contentment and you give everything you've got today. When you go home, you've given everything you've got, what more could you have given? That's what we call good enough. Ajahn Brahm, we now have to conduct our Dharma school classes online. May I humbly request for suggestions on some of the things we can do with our students online. Thank you very much. So sometimes, you know, you can invite questions. Sometimes you can be innovative and uh, have little competitions on honesty, on other precepts. So it takes a lot of innovation, but if you have a good, calm mind and you're willing to take risks, you can actually ask the kids, the Dharma school kids, what would you like to add to our online classes? So don't just do the old stuff. Sometimes and just make new suggestions, new ideas, you know, like we do with meditating, uh, meditation retreats over Zoom. But someone first suggested this, you know, almost six months ago. I was a bit dubious. You know, will meditation retreats work over Zoom, over the internet? They seem to be doing fine. Now, can I really connect with people when all you see is a screen? But the first meditation retreat I did over Zoom, I was quite surprised. Now, for some reason or another, I did kind of connect with my audience. And they could feel there was a connection there. I don't know how it worked, but it made the whole retreat far better than I imagined was possible. So anyway, try your very best and just uh, see what you can do online. Maybe have a few cartoons you can get from somewhere. But anyway, before I do another question, I forgot it is toilet time. It is going with the flow time. So shall we have a five minute um, uh, break for people? Yes or no? Oh, yes. Yes, no. thank you. Okay, okay, great. Okay, five minute break for toilet. And I can just drink some water and have, give my mouth a bit of a break. John. Yeah. Uh, tip recorder, you don't need a break. <laughs> okay, I'll just sort of be quiet for a while. I'm trying to answer as many questions as possible because I know that there's more questions on the screen than anyone can ever answer. But as that person said, three times they tried to ask a question before I could get, get to it. So you try your very best. They're really good questions people ask. I try the best to answer them, but sometimes you might not hit the spot because sometimes you don't get enough information exactly what the problem is. But you try the very best to try and 
give an answer which hopefully will cover most possibilities. John, what's the latest update on Anukampa? Oh, on Anukampa, uh, in lockdown, remember they rented a house in Oxford and uh, Venerable Chandler is still there. I think till next June, the other rental uh, finishes, but she's really hoping and I'm encouraging her that by that time, July, hopefully she will be able to come to Perth to do a retreat. She usually comes for the three month retreat at China Grove and hopefully that she can do a bit extra, do maybe a six month retreat there. And after that six month retreat, it will be the time for looking for a common, looking for another place like a real retreat center and getting some more people to help her. So at the moment she's by herself. And so sometimes she gets a bit worn out uh, with all the work she has to do, the admin work. And still she's giving retreats online and giving talks. She's giving talks for the uh, Bodhi Nyan and Buddhist Fellowship as well. So it's a bit tough for her because she's by herself there. We almost arranged one of the, the nuns from Dharmasara to go over there. The nun had agreed, yes, I can go over there for three months or six months just to check it out. But then, of course, COVID happened and the nun couldn't travel. Uh, John, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, you see, um, are we breaking a precept, uh, the no alcohol precept, if we um, use the alcohol to cook or when we add something that has alcohol in its content? Are we it breaking depends. The, you know, hmm? If you cook it after you add the alcohol, then most of the alcohol evaporates. Mm -hmm. So it is not um, intoxicating. Many okay. people do that. So if there's no alcohol left, then it's not breaking the precept. Oh, if we cook it, the alcohol goes off, it's okay. Yeah. But if you mm -hmm. add the alcohol afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> then, then that's a bit dangerous. Uh, not drink like that. Cooking yeah. it is okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. So the, if the alcohol is inside the, the, the as a preservative in food, it's okay, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, but as long it's as because it's very little, very min, min, yeah, minute. Yeah. Mm. If it's not going to uh, alter your mindfulness, then there's no problem. Okay, thank you so much. It's Christmas and New Year, Chinese New Year coming up soon, so people love just making fancy foods, and sometimes they do add alcohol to it. And I still remember four monks when I was a young monk, they got some wine gums from Canada, from the relation. Wine gums are just like sweets. Ah. And most sweets, no, they don't have alcohol in it, but these were special ones. They did have alcohol in it. Mm -hmm. And the four, these four monks, they, yeah, they're, they're all still, okay. no, no, one disrobe okay. uh, later on, but the three monks are now senior monks. I won't say their names. Mm -hmm. They're senior monks and they were all drunk. They were just laughing around and joking around. And we found out why you just change your characters so much. We found out had these wine gums they shared with each other and they had real wine in them. And they were so sensitive being monks and not having any alcohol for a while. <laughs> they did get a bit tipsy. <laughs> oh, that was a funny day. We are all back, Ajahn. Okay. So the question is, what is a karmic effect of not swapping, but swatting, killing houseflies, mosquitoes to get rid of them? It's not the very best thing to do. So the nicest thing to do, if you can, just be a bit more careful having fly screens and you know, fly screen doors and stuff. So you somehow or other don't allow those uh, flies, mosquitoes actually to get inside the house. And then you don't have to really squat so many or swap any at all. So of course, you know, we right now in Perth is heaps of house flies. I mean, the, this is a time of the year they really, really swarm. 
but we make sure that when we open the door, we just swish a piece of cloth or a broom. You know, it doesn't hurt the flies. It just makes them leave the, the area of the door so we can walk in so flies don't come in to the, uh, the room. The same with mosquitoes. It takes a bit more effort, but you can actually keep most of the mosquitoes and flies out of your house without having to kill them. But if you do kill them, especially if it's your intention is to protect yourself or your children from things like dengue fever, you can't say that's really great bad karma. <laughs> it's not really heavy bad karma. It's not the same as killing an animal or go out hunting like a deer in the forest. It's only a small bad karma. If you can avoid it, please do. Because you know, it's not something you really want to do. Expressions of gratitude to Ajahn Bamali. Thank you, Ajahn. The way you shared the suit has been most inspiring. Oh, this is actually going to me. Ajahn Bamali is not here. You have passion, compassion, and kindness. I experienced an outpouring of emotions during yesterday's death contemplation meditation. Oh, excellent. Uh, maybe someone can copy that and just email it to him. Hi, Ajahn. My mom passed away two years ago, and I always have this feeling of guilt for not being by her side when she died and loving her enough. Is there anything I can do for her now as a Buddhist learner? Thanks. Yes, I wasn't with my mother when she died, because I was here in Perth and she was in London. But I knew my mother would not have minded at all. My mother loved me, knew what I was doing, helping other people here in Australia. So what you can do is, feeling of guilt is mostly undeserved. If you could ask your mother, imagine if she was alive right now, or you could somehow contact her spirit, what would she say to you when you said, oh, I'm sorry for not being there at the time when you died, or I feel guilty for not being there with you? What would she say? And most mothers will look at their child and say, no, don't worry about that, I understand. And you had your own family, your own businesses to do, and you can't always be there by my side, it's okay. So that takes away a bit of the guilt. But the other thing to do, and when I did this to my father, when I learned you know, about Buddhism, and I was more sensitive to my conduct as a young man around my father, I remember one day just getting some flowers and incense and candles and going up to the Buddha statue. I couldn't say forgiveness to my father because he was not there anymore. And saying forgiveness to him through the Buddha, saying, Dad, it's the first time I've done this. I was a young monk at the time. But, you know, whatever I've done by body, speech or mind, or what I didn't do, which I should have done, either on purpose or just out of stupidity or just accident, please, Dad, I ask your forgiveness. And I did that much slower than what I've just repeated. I did that with full intensity and with all my emotions strong to ask forgiveness in front of the Buddha. And that was the best I could do. And it really worked. I, mean, I felt just so much better afterwards. I'd done something as much as I possibly could. And of course, I always remember my father and try and uh, keep some of the wonderful things which he told me and to practice them. I always remember that he was one who told me those things. So that's the way you can pay respects to your mum. First of all, just take a little gift, flowers, candles and incense or something to a Buddha statue alone by yourself. And just with all of the kindness and, and love and gratitude you have to, for a father, or for your mum, sorry. And say, mum, whatever I've done, body, speech or mind, intentional or accidental, or what I didn't do. Please forgive me. I really mean this. And offer those flowers, candles, incense to your to the Buddha statue for your mum. And then for the rest of your life, remember her teachings, examples, all the good things she taught you. And when you do anything good, remember her because of her you do this. That's the best way that you can respect your mother's memory, by doing good in her name.
Dear Ajahn, I've already been practicing meditation for 10 years. I already conditioned by you to do nothing in meditation. But in the daily activities, how to practice this, I found I still swayed by feeling an unwholesome mind. So I still suffer. Yeah, in been doing this nothing, relaxing, resting in meditation, sometimes you don't do nothing. It's like nothing doing. You're relaxed and at peace, mindful, at ease, caring for this moment, making peace, being kind, being gentle with every moment. And in daily activities, that's how you practice in daily activities. That to whoever's in front of you, whether it's a boss or a customer, whether it's you know, a person you're meeting on the underground train or the, the train, whatever, and they're right in front of you, they're important. And all you ever do is care. You care for them. You care for your boss, you care for your uh, the clients as much as you possibly can. And then you find that because you're just with this one person at a time, this one thing at a time, you do everything you've got right now, you find that you become very efficient. Many people in business, they're always when they're at work, they're thinking of when they're going to be at home. When they're at home, they're thinking of going to work. They're never really here. So your meditation should center you much more in the present moment, in the now. The kindness should grow more and more in your life. And that actually makes you a much more efficient worker. Whatever work you do, you're kind. Which means that other people want to help you, you help them in your workplace. And you don't waste so many times with the office, so much hours in office politics of trying to get on in the business. You're kind and a good sort of uh, team worker. Anyway, you're, you're still swayed by feeling an unwholesome mind, but you recognize that, you're mindful to it, and to see if you can work more on that in the next 10 years. Next question. How would I know the nimitta is real or just my imagination? You know, there is hardly any difference between imaginary nimittas and real nimittas. To the point that there's one type of meditation called kasina meditation, K-A-S-I-N-A. -A. Not casino meditation, that's not meditation at all by going to the casino. This is kasina meditation. And the way you do kasina meditation is if you've got a very visual mind and you can imagine very well, you close your eyes and you imagine just a circle of light. And to help you, the meditators have like a cardboard um, piece of paper, or a piece of cardboard, and they put like a, a circular image on it, painting in a favorite color. And they look at that, they close their eyes, they imagine it. When the image disappears, you look at it again until you can imagine, visualize that circle of light with your eyes closed for long periods of time. And then what happened? That turns into a nimitta. One of the signs it's a nimitta and not just imagination is the colors are so much deeper than anything you can see with your, your eyes. If it is a blue nimitta, it's more blue than blue. Anyone who's seen an image or experienced that know what I'm talking about. It's like yellow. You recognize it as yellow if it's a yellow nimitta you see, but nothing like the yellows are painted on walls in um, art galleries. It's a much deeper, richer, beautiful yellow. Anyway, um, so anyway, this is actually how one develops those uh, nimittas. And you may start with the imaginary limiters, but give it some trust and faith and it can turn into a real one. Because these are all mind made. And the real limiters usually come when the person is very peaceful, when the body is disappearing or has totally disappeared. So the five senses have calmed down and the limiter is seen through the sixth sense of mind. So if it's a real limiter, you'll notice that you're hardly hearing any sound. Any sounds are like 100 miles away and you hardly feel anything on your body. The body's nice and calm. So the five senses are very, very subdued when limiters come up. Dear Ajahn, what is the difference between mindfulness and meditation? So 
what's the difference between air and breathing? You need air to breathe, you need mindfulness to meditate. So mindfulness is part of meditation. But meditation is bigger than mindfulness. Although that many people teach mindfulness and they include all these other things like kindness, like the good conduct, like uh, stillness. Each one of these, mindfulness and all these other attributes, they build up together and they become your meditation. With moments of what feels clarity in meditation, how do you have confidence in some thoughts as to whether it's true, especially if they are more esoteric? Yeah, well, you can actually check them from, say, the suttas and what the Buddha taught. And if you find that it's you know, right there as the Buddha taught, that gives you confidence that your thought is verified by the suttas. But even more than that, if you get deep in meditation, I don't just mean clarity, I mean body disappearing, limiters, and even jhanas, then when you come out from those states of mind, you can have total confidence that how you interpret things and see things, that's pretty accurate. The reason is because the five hindrances, the Pajaniwarana, have been subdued. And when the five hindrances have been subdued, there's nothing to distort, uh, nothing to distort your cognitive process anymore. So what you see, you can trust as being real. So that's why meditation gives you the confidence that after meditation, deep meditation, what you see is true. Dear Ajahn, kindly enlighten what is it the what is it that follows one to take rebirth? Energy, consciousness, waves. It is what's called the stream of consciousness. It's uh, just like it's causality. One thing causes another, which causes another, which causes another. And the simile I usually give is a simile of eating a mango and planting the mango. So you plant the, man the seed of the mango, having eaten the, the delicious flesh, and you put it in the earth. You know what happens next, that eventually that seed uh, splits and a little shoot comes up, it germinates. And every day that little shoot grows, in other words, it's causality, makes a bigger shoot, bigger shoot, bigger shoot, bigger shoot, until it pushes through the top of the earth. And it appears like a tiny piece of grass coming up from the earth. You don't realize at first that this is uh, the mango growing. And it grows bigger and bigger and then the grass becomes wooden at the base and you realize this is a plant, not a piece of grass. It grows bigger and bigger and maybe it might branch out and it's the first sign of these branches and twigs on this little sapling. It goes bigger and bigger and bigger, and more branches, more leaves. And then there's a young baby mango growing, a uh, mango tree growing. And then it comes a time it's big enough, it puts out these flowers on the end of the twigs and branches. And those flowers get uh, pollinated and the, the base of the flower swells and becomes uh, fatter. And you realize that's a mango, a mango fruit growing. And eventually that grows big enough and big enough and big enough. And then you can pluck it or it falls off, you have a mango fruit. So the, what went from the first mango to the second mango? It's just like a cause and effect, a continuous cause and effect process, which from the first mango to the second mango, just like the human being from the end of life, the stream of consciousness, especially this mind, the sixth consciousness, this moment causes the next moment, which causes the, which causes the next moment. And even that space after, after death, until there's an opportunity to find a place, a womb, in which that stream of consciousness can be reborn. Do Ajahn, after listening to your numerous talks, I still can't figure out what you mean by being kind to the parts of the body which is in pain to individuals who have hurt us. Uh, parts of your body which are in pain, or parts or being kind to individuals who have hurt you. There's two different questions there. So being kind to parts of your body which are in pain is 
All right. I don't know if you can remember your, maybe you had a very kind mother or maybe grandmother. And sometimes that when you were sick or you were hurting, like my mother, I remember so many times when I was playing soccer in the, in the street and going for a tackle and then scraping the skin off my knees. I remember just my knees were always had scabs on them of dried blood because I love playing soccer and you didn't really worry too much. You went for a tackle and you hurt your, your knee and scraped the skin off it. And I would run to my mother crying, a young boy, and my mother would just kneel down and she would kiss that wound. And she always used to call it kissing it better. She wouldn't disinfect it, just kissing it. And I remember every time she kissed it, it gave me this wonderful kindness, which only a mother can give to her son, that all that pain disappeared. And I never, you know, I, mean, I did put a, a Band-Aid on it and then went off playing soccer again. And I realized from that, that the kindness has a great therapeutical power. And other times you have like nurses, if you're in hospital, they just look upon you or hold your hand. They smile upon you and their kindness lessens the pain in your body. And if you haven't got a mother or a nurse, you're by yourself, then you can actually look at that part of the body, which is hurting, which is in pain. And give you that same sort of kindness, which a mother gives to her children or a nurse has been trained to give to the patients. Just that smile, that kindness, that softness. And it, I do that to my own body and the body relaxes and is at ease and the pain mostly vanishes. And I'm trying to get rid of that pain. I don't like it and I'm negative towards it. The pain gets stronger and tighter and I'm kind to it. It tends to relax and it's not as painful anymore. And be kind to individuals who have hurt us. Being kind to individuals who have hurt us is actually a kindness to yourself. They've hurt you once, you don't want them to hurt you again. And every time you remember it, they're hurting you. So by being kind to yourself, it's like letting it go. You don't need to be a victim anymore when you let it go. They're no longer hurting you. Only the memories of them cause you the hurt. So little by little we can let that go and that's a great act of kindness to ourselves. And kindness to them also is just, why, why did they do that? This was a saying of the Dalai Lama who once said that if you have someone who's always irritating you, giving you a very hard time, please always remember that you only have to meet them for a few hours every day. They have to be with themselves 24 seven for the rest of their life. So, and how they treat you is often how they treat themselves. Not always, but often. So being kind to them. If someone is just really miserable and nasty to you, you feel what a terrible life they are living and how much pain and suffering they have. So you don't really think of yourself. You think of how much kindness you can give to them. That's one way of doing it, if it's possible for you. Okie dokie, it's nine o'clock now, so you've turned the questions off. Thank you very much. I don't know why, but it's hard to say. Very good. This evening I've got a bit of low energy. I don't know why. Maybe my throat is a bit sore. I think I was just talking to the monks too much today. My own fault. But anyway, I wish Thank you all. Thank you, Rajan. Have a good rest. A very Maybe happy evening. Maybe you want to hear the sound from the audience. <laughs> the connection. <laughs> yeah, no, they're fine. Okay, so good night, good night. everybody. Good night. Have a nice supper. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Have a good Bye. rest. Bye. Bye. Yay. Bye.